Welcome to First in Fiction, your first stop for learning to write fantastic fiction. I'm your host, Aaron Gansky, author of The Bargain, The Hand of Adonai series, and Firsts in Fiction. And I'm Alton Gansky, the author of numerous uh, books, novels, and nonfiction. And not with us tonight is Molly Jo Reilly. Uh, a little under the weather, that stuff is kind of going around, and so uh, she asked for the night off, and I refused, uh, so she quit. Uh, but I'm going to hire her again tomorrow, uh, which is nice. Uh, but uh, I will be doing my best to monitor the chat room tonight. I know I won't be able to do it as efficiently or effectively as she does, but uh, thoughts and prayers with Molly. Hope you feel better soon. Get some rest. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and blame you since you're not here for all the technical difficulties that we have been uh, experiencing tonight. So uh, that's that's what we're going to do, right? It's, it's Molly's fault. Isn't that what uh, we agreed on, Dad? Always blame the person who's not there and give them Excellent. an additional job to do. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Molly, we do miss you. Um, and so we apologize for our late start, but uh, we're here now and uh, having some more technical difficulties with Google. Can't get our lower thirds there. So if you're looking to uh, to find us on our internet web presences, you can find Pops at altongansky.com and me at aarongansky.com. Uh, and of course, if you're watching on YouTube, we'd appreciate a thumbs up and uh, subscribe. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell so you get uh, updates whenever we broadcast every other Tuesday at 6, 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So we moved it up. <laughs> That's why things are a little hectic tonight. So uh, up to 166 subscribers, Pops. Um, so nice. Yeah, we just crested uh, 100 not too long ago. And so... Uh, Two thirds increase uh, in just a, a matter of a couple of months, so that's it's kind of nice. Appreciate all of you who have subscribed, and uh, I hope that you continue to enjoy our new content. Uh, Pops, you have the novel spotlight tonight. I do, I do. I was just wondering if you were going to blame Molly for the uh, growth in the subscriptions. Uh, no, 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 no. If it's if it's something positive, it's my fault. If it's something negative, it's her fault. Um, I she signed a contract. It's if she didn't read it carefully. I mean, that's on her, right? So, uh, so praise goes to you, and blame goes to her. Absolutely. That's uh, that's how I like things. Of course, uh, nobody actually believes that, which is uh, probably shows that they're wise, I guess. But uh, yeah. I just know that I'm going to stay out of it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, pops. What do you got for us tonight? <coughs> All right, for the novel spotlight, I've chosen um, the the book for this one since it's my turn. Uh, the Taking by Dean Koontz, two thousand four Bantam Books, uh, four hundred forty eight pages in the original release. Anyway, it's been re released I think uh, several times with that. You know, when I think of uh, books by Dean Koontz, several titles uh, float to the surface of my mind, uh, but I've not talked about this one on the show. Uh, but other titles: Strangers, Soul Survivor, Odd Thomas. Uh, one Door Away, uh, From Heaven, Lightning. There's really a whole bunch of them because he's a, a master of the genre uh, that I first started writing in. Uh, and I wrote in, the, uh, and, and still do, in Supernatural Suspense, uh, but did so for a Christian audience. He wrote for General Market, and he did uh, a lot of science fiction early on. As Well, he wrote everything early on to get his start. Um, but then he's kind of settled into the, the mysterious, uh, sometimes supernatural suspense, or just the weird suspense. Uh, and he's very, very good. Unbeknownst to him, he became my mentor, and the reason he became my mentor is the way he put words together, the way he told story, the way he did uh, dialogue. Um, it's really just a graduate education in how to write a book, and you could choose almost any of his books, um, say, especially from his uh, middle career on, uh, and get really an excellent uh, lesson. Uh, so I've learned a great deal from him. One of the books that... Uh, uh, lingers with me the most is this book called uh, The Taking. Uh, he uh, he took all my favorite parts of supernatural, science fiction, suspense. He blended a riveting cocktail of weirdness uh, and the power of human spirit. So there's a lot of that in his writing where there's this idea of uh, the human spirit ultimately prevailing over sadness, sorrow, uh, fear, danger, that sort of thing. It's a, a great story. Molly Sloan is the protagonist. She's a best-selling novelist. I don't know what it is about novelists writing about novelists, uh, but it, it seems that many of them do that. Stephen King has done it. Many others uh, have done that. Molly Sloan is a protagonist, and she's married to an ex-priest, uh, and uh, 
she and her husband live in a small town and the small town is a wonderful thing. Uh, and most people who write supernatural suspense will sooner or later do a small town book where something happens in a small town, it's isolated, it needs help, they have to pull together or fall apart. Um, so that's done quite a bit. It's almost a genre unto itself. Uh, and it uh, begins with this rainstorm, but instead of being comfortable, uh, it kind of lull you to sleep. At 1 a.m., this thing wakes her up, and uh, then it just gets weird from there. It's, it's, uh, he uses a line about the uh, as if the rain were trying to make entry into the house, and he describes it uh, beautifully. And to make things uh, even uh, more weird, it is a uh, rain that glows. It's a glowing rain. And it scares all the animals in this mountain community. And she goes out to check on things. She stands by her glass door, and there's a bunch of coyotes huddled by the door looking to her like she's going to help and other animals. Um, so it's terrifying for the animals. And soon, uh, even though the rain will go away, uh, a fog appears. There's just all kinds of different things that appear. And uh, it's just the beginning of the problems. And so the small town has to pull together and deal with all this really weird stuff. Well-written book, always great characterization. Lots of plot points that are uh, riveting. And so from beginning to end, I think it's just a great book. So for uh, my contribution to the novel Spotlight, uh, Dean Kuntz's The Taking from 2004, and it's been re-released many times since then. So you can get a, a little later uh, version of it. Appreciate that, Pops. Uh, I just recently read a, a couple months ago, Soul Survivor uh, by Dean Kuntz on your recommendation. Was not disappointed. Uh, <clears throat> Creepy and weird, uh, but also just uh, very well executed. What I like about it is, even though it's creepy and weird, um, what he does not lose sight of is, as you say, the human spirit and the connections that tie us together and, and the human relationships that we have, as opposed to the non-human relationships that some of us have. I, But you understand what I'm trying to say here. Well, no, uh, you might be okay with that because Dean Koontz always has a dog in his story. There you go. Um, and he had a... Trixie was his uh, golden retriever. Trixie died some years back. And as I understand it anyway, it was devastating for he and his wife. And I think they have another dog now, but they've, um, what was it? He said, uh, petting a dog, petting a dog can uh, do more for a person than uh, a psychologist and does more for the soul, almost as much for the soul as prayer. Hmm. Um, so there are, uh, Many dogs that appear in his stories one way or the other. I think we need to maybe do a cast. I feel like we've done one some time ago about animals in fiction and, and using animals and how they interact with your characters. But uh, I, I think we did. Uh, maybe we'll do another one. It's been a while. So if you're interested in that kind of subject matter, because we could probably do an entire podcast on it, uh, go ahead and search uh, AaronGansky.com, see if you can find that in the, the archives. Back in the days uh, when Steve and I were doing it together, uh, you, if you are a longtime listener, you remember uh, my buddy Steve McLean, who you started this podcast with me, actually prompted me to get it going. And uh, then later on, we were joined by uh, Heather Luby. And, and tonight we're looking at how to read like a writer. And I have blatantly plagiarized Heather Luby here. She put these notes together with, back when she was on the show. So I don't feel bad because she did it for our show. But we're going to be using her notes tonight and looking at. Um, how to read like a writer, what it means to read like a writer, how you can do it, how it can improve your fiction. Um, and uh, so that's that's what we're going to be looking at. What we didn't have last time, though, if you're thinking this is just going to be a repeat, it's not. Because what we did not have on our last show was Pops. So Pops, you're going to be weighing in here with a lot of your uh, thoughts and ideas as well. Correcting uh, so things? Correcting things. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you take that up with Heather. <laughs> but uh, um yeah, I think there are actually a couple places where uh, you might disagree. At least one I saw in the show notes where um, where you uh, took a, a different stance. I, I won't say you disagreed, but you took a different stance. And um, that's what I like uh, about this podcast. We're able to give people different perspectives uh, on particular issues. And we don't prescribe one particular way, but we provide options for them. So I think that's always uh, beneficial. As we say probably every week, you need to find out what works for you. Uh, but I think what we can both agree on, Pops, and what Heather would definitely agree on if she were still here. Um, wow, that sounded like she died or something. Um, if she were still on the podcast, she's she's been very busy. She's fine. Uh, if you're worried about her, she's fine. Uh, I've spoken with her around the new year and just super, super busy. Um, so 
moving on, if she were on the cast still, uh, you and her and I would all agree that you have to read. Uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, but you can't just read necessarily for fun or for enjoyment. You, when you're reading, uh, you should probably be on the clock. Uh, you should be thinking about what you're reading in context of your own writing. Uh, and I think that actually unlocks a lot of things in novels that you wouldn't see otherwise. For me, that is a process that it's like a, watching a master musician work. Uh, if you're a guitar player and you're watching a Stevie Vai or a, a Jimi Hendrix and you're watching the way their fingers move and how they're playing the notes and how they're getting the particular sounds, uh, that's, that's the way that we should be reading. Um, not all the time. You can pick up a comic book and read for fun, but for the most part, when you're, you've got a novel in your hands, you should be reading it as a writer, asking yourself some central questions. So uh, you're not just reading for content uh, or to better understand the ideas in the writing. You're trying to understand how the piece of writing was put together by the author and what you can learn about writing um, by reading a particular text. The goal is to read like a writer. Uh, the goal is to locate what you believe are the most important writerly choices. That's what you're looking at. The writerly choices represented in the text, choices as large as the overall structure or as small as a single word used only once to consider the effect of those choices on potential readers. So you want to think about um, the author and why he or she made the choices that he or she did and the impact that they're trying to elicit from their readers. Then you take that one step further and you imagine what different choices the author might have made instead and what the effects of those different choices would have on readers. Uh, Pops, what do you, what do you have uh, to say with that? Well, uh, I certainly agree with you, uh, especially if you're just starting. Uh, writers read, I think I've told the story probably several times before, but I remember watching a World Series game and Stephen King, who's a big fan of baseball, was at the game and he was reading between the innings. And a reporter asked him about that. And he said, well, you know, there's nothing going on between the innings, so I'm not going to waste the time. And uh, then even promoted the book. I can't remember it was, but I think it was a new author. Uh, and so he's constantly reading. And it's, you know, because he enjoys it. Uh, but also, I, I think he's just keeping up with things, too. Uh, so reading is very important to keep your mind in the game. Uh, and you can also find it inspiring. You learn from mistakes and the way things are done. So when I teach writing individuals or uh, to classes, one of the first pieces of advice I give is to ruin your reading. And I get a lot of weird responses to that, but ruin your reading. And what I mean by that is don't just read. Uh, if you're going to be a writer, you need to analyze. So this is hard for writers to hear. And I've had a few tell me, well, I don't want to be a writer if I have to ruin my reading. Well, of course, I try to explain to them what I mean by that is you, you need to read deeper and with an analytical mind, you need to read not only to be entertained and to enjoy, but to learn how a particular author, especially a good one, is doing things. So it's one reason um, we're drawn to to uh, writing in the first place is we we love the reading, we love words. So that's usually our, our first entrance to this idea of us becoming a writer. Uh, but like it or not, professional analyze what other professionals do, and that's what we as writers must do. New surgeons learn from experienced surgeons. Songwriters study the songs of um, uh, other uh, songwriters uh, and, and other musicians. They study all of that. Uh, musicians study each other. Uh, performers study performance. Actors study other actors uh, to learn something new. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but also to learn what not to do. Because if something goes bad, you want to know that too. Uh, you know, if you're driving down the road, this happened to me many times before, where a car's in front of me, and all of a sudden you see the car bottom out as it goes through an intersection. Um, it doesn't take long to learn that you'd better slow down, because you just learned from that person's mistake. They uh, they hit a gully or whatever it is there, a big pothole, whatever it might be. Okay, you learn from that. Same thing in writing. If somebody makes a mistake, uh, does a you know something bad with dialogue or description or something, or just forgets description, then you say to yourself, "Well, okay." I need to make sure I don't do that. Not to be critical of them, but to use it as a warning for yourself. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I've seen mistakes being made, like a pickup driving way too fast on the 15 northbound uh, in the pouring rain and uh, basically spinning completely out of control, 
across four lanes of traffic directly in front of me. Um, I learned from that experience. And yeah. luckily, I didn't have to be in the pickup truck to do it. I think everyone was okay with that. They ended up right side up and on the side of the road. So good for them. Um, but uh, yeah, same thing with with reading, as you said, Pops. You've, you've used that term ruin your reading. I've heard it before. And sometimes that has, like you say, a negative connotation. For me, it, it's... Um, it hasn't ruined my reading. I wouldn't use that term. I would say it's, I think I used the term earlier, unlocked it. It's, it's um, leveled it up to use a, a video game expression. I, I feel like um, it's, it's something that I enjoy to do. I enjoy studying. Um, and I know that's, that's weird. Sometimes you just want to go and listen to music, but I can't listen to music the same way anymore since I was a performer, since I was in a band, I listen to music differently and I enjoy the way that I do it. I just, uh, we've got the 4k channel and, and, um, they'll do concerts a lot of times and I'll record them and I'll watch what musicians are doing. Cause it's still a part of me. It's still in me. Um, in the same way that when I read a novel, I'm looking at it differently. I'm looking at it with new eyes. I'm looking at it, as you say, as a professional, okay. let me put a little more perspective in that. When I say ruin your reading, I'm dealing with people who are not yet writers. They want to be writers. And many of those that I've encountered over the years that I've been teaching this stuff for a long time, um, it's it's like teenagers who want to be in love. They're in love mm -hmm. with love. And so they feel they're in love with the first person that comes along. Uh, and it's the way with uh, budding writers. They think they want to be a writer until they learn what it takes to be a writer. The things you have to learn, the things you have to set aside, the sacrifices you have to make. And that's not unique to writers. It doesn't matter what you study or what you do. There's always those kinds of sacrifices. And what I have found is um, the one thing they often don't do is they don't take the opportunity to study when they're reading. That's what they're going to be trafficking in. That is their uh, skill set. And it's a, again, it's like taking a college class. If you've, you have a good writer and you're reading, it's like taking a college class with that. But I have found many people who say they want to be writers just want to read. Um, and they want maybe the fame or and trust me, there's not all that fame for most of us writers, uh, but they think there's gonna be a lot of fame or money or, are something prestige in uh, in writing, uh, and maybe that's what they want. What I have found uh, with those who really want to be writers and become writers is they still enjoy reading, but they not only enjoy the story, they enjoy the technique. Uh, they enjoy the way it's uh, been written, and for them, that's another level, as, as you were talking about leveling up, that's another level of uh, entertainment and enjoyment in reading. Yeah, and I think we should probably be a little more explicit. I think most of our listeners have already figured this out. But when we're talking about reading like a writer, what we're talking about is reading uh, novels and fiction specifically. Um, this is not to say that that reading a craft book is unimportant. Uh, it would be the equivalent of taking a, a art class if you're a painter, uh, taking an art class to learn the techniques as opposed to studying an already done painting and analyzing which brushes were used, which uh, the composition of the colors, the type of canvas, uh, and those different uh, artistly, artistry choices, whatever the proper adjective there is, um, those types of, of choices that the painter is making. I still maintain that you should be reading craft books. Uh, mine specifically would be great. But uh, also, you know, I guess some others like Mystery and Manners, Bird by Bird, uh, Stephen King's on writing. Uh, we've got a whole list of them. We've talked about them before. We've done entire podcasts on them. I have a uh, whole page important. on my website um, of uh, craft books that have meant something to me. Yeah. So if you go to my website, altengansky.com, there's a page where it says books for writers. Um, you know, those are ones that have mattered to me. Strunk and White, you know, Getting the Words Right by Cheney and some of those that have uh, made a difference for me. Yeah, it, it's a it's a great list. I I've put lists like that together, and and I've put them on my website as well. But they're not quite as easy to find as yours. So maybe I'll have to add a, a page as well. I'll steal your idea because it's good. So um, we should probably talk about how uh, reading like a writer is different than a normal reader. Uh, what normal readers do, um, and usually what we're doing if we're picking up a book is we're going to read for information or we're going to read for pleasure. Uh, but if we're going to read like a writer, what we need to do is, again, analyze those choices that are being made. We're looking at how things are constructed, how they're put together, um, and how we might do the same. Always, you want to bring it back to your own writing. What can I learn from this? Uh, what does it mean for my writing? 
you might even call this something like reading like an architect or reading like a carpenter. Pops, you were an architect for a while. Do you see any similarities between uh, looking at a plan, a set of blueprints maybe, and, and reading a novel as a writer? There is. When I was in architecture, one of uh, my great joys was looking at uh, plans. In fact, I still do this um, from other architects. Uh, I'm not a licensed architect. I want to make that clear. Um, but I was working in architecture. I was a project manager doing the drawings and uh, stuff like that. Um, and I still have a, a great joy. Uh, there's some places online and um, uh, through an app that I have, I get a lot of news feed to me. One of them has to do with architecture. And I love looking at the design uh, and the layout and learning from how they put those spaces together so that they work and then uh, look as good as they do. So it's, it's certainly that you're learning the uh, some of the construction, uh, but not just, uh, just the construction of the structure, but the construction of the space. Uh, and so I can, I can guarantee you, uh, architects look at the work of other architects. Um, engineers look at the work of other engineers. It's uh, even cooks, I think, even chefs look at the work of other chefs, see if they can't look uh, or find something uh, to go along with that. So I think the best thing to do is we look for brilliance. That's the best thing when you're uh, reading uh, like a writer, you're looking for brilliance. The thing that makes you stop, the thing that makes you uh, savor a word choice or a sentence or a sentence that shocks you. Why did that shock me? What did he do to me here? Uh, a choice of uh, plot point, all these things, the use of twists. You look for brilliance. But do also look for faults. That's okay. If you find a, a fault, then uh, it's just a warning sign for you uh, not to do the same thing. Uh, that's just the way life is. We all make mistakes. Uh, just learn from it. Uh, again, don't be critical of the of the writer. Um, just learn from it and go on and make sure that you don't make the same kind of mistake. Uh, so, you know, I, I once noticed a, a recurring fault in uh, someone's writing. And I was I was going through the book and I was thinking, you know, uh, that I, I wouldn't do it that way. Then that turned into really shouldn't do that. Uh, I can't figure out why they keep doing this. And then it hit me uh, like a bat to the head. I was doing that in my work in progress. The same thing. Uh, I just couldn't see it in mine. I could see it in his. <laughs> After that, I thought, yeah, well, I, I've got to go sit down and uh, redo this. Um, fix those things before I send it into my editors. And so that person did me a great favor. That wasn't his intent, but he did me a great favor by uh, doing something wrong. And uh, I, I was fortunate enough to recognize it. And then even more fortunate to recognize I was doing it. Um, yeah. I didn't like admitting that, but, you know, I'd rather yeah. fix a problem than keep doing it. I've done the same thing myself. There have been several books where I, I, I read it and I go, man, why are they doing that? That's, that's so lame. And then it's like, oh, I've been doing the same thing. And so <laughs> um, it'll call you out. It'll call you out sometimes. But when, I think one of the things that, that the reason we make these mistakes is because we're looking at the microcosm. We're not able to focus on the larger picture because we're still working on our novel. It's probably a first draft still. Uh, but when we can look at it in context of a complete work, um, sometimes those, those little details, those little mistakes, those things that kind of bug us, we all have our own little pet peeves. Um, they call attention to themselves through the process of reading. Oh, this is something I've seen this guy do before, or, oh, I, you know, I really like the way this guy is doing it. But, um, it, when you're thinking a bit again about how it affects your own writing, am I doing this? Usually you'll go, oh, I've done that. You'll see it as you go back through your project again. Um, you may not remember, oh, I did that in such and such a story, but you, when you look at such and such a story again, you'll notice, oh, wow, I did that. I, I probably shouldn't have. So yeah, those kind of call attention. You know, I've done a lot of editing. Uh, I sometimes get hired by publishers to do some editing on work uh, and just recently did one that was a novelization of a movie that's coming out later this month. Again, I didn't write the book. I was just doing editing. And the guy's very good at what he did. It was the easiest edit I've ever done. Um, with that, but I've learned early on in editing, it is much easier to see someone else's mistakes than to see your own. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can find all kinds of problems in any, anyone's book, uh, but boy, I have to work to find the problems in mine. And I need to do that. I just need to know that about myself. So reading other people's work helps me do that. I, if I see something they're doing strikes me as wrong, then I sometimes go back and check and make sure I haven't been doing that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely.
Yeah, it's it's important to do that. When you're reading like a writer, I think it's important to remember that you should be writing at the same time. Um, you're not taking two or three months off of your book, but you're you're writing in the mornings or in the afternoons or in the evenings, whatever works for you. You're reading on your lunch break or before you go to work or after, when you get home or before you know you go to bed, whatever the case is. Um, I advocate that you should be reading at the same time. Well, <laughs> in the same day that you're you're writing as well. Don't put your writing aside. Um, and in so doing, uh, you'll still have that writing mindset in your mind. Instead of taking a, a break um, from writing and, and just reading just for the sake of reading, uh, if you're writing at the same time that you're reading, you will naturally, I think, read like a writer. And when you do... I, uh, go ahead, Pops. Yeah, uh, I'm going to share a little more about that in, uh, in a minute, uh, something similar, but... Uh, this is just a little bit different. Uh, I know some people, and I have done this uh, while writing, one of the first things I would do to begin my writing day when I sat down to work is have a, a good book by an author I respect and read a chapter. And that uh, gets the juices flowing, gets my mind uh, in sync with writing, putting words together and sentences and uh, dialogue and all of those kinds of things. Um, so that's really a good thing to do. And again, it's reading to help yourself. I sit down and uh, read, even if it's just a page or two, it's amazing what that will kickstart uh, in my mind. Hmm. Absolutely. Well said, well said. So when you're reading, for me, it's all about questions, the questions that you ask. So you should have these questions kind of in the back of your mind and, and it's they should be nagging you as you read. Uh, first question would be, what is the writer's purpose? What is their intent? What are they trying to do? Uh, you might even ask how successful they are and why or why they aren't successful. Uh, ask yourself who's reading this. For example, if I'm reading a, a chick lit romance, I can't fault the writer for using uh, too much interior monologue or whatever the case may be. That's just kind of the, what's, you know, par for the course in the genre. It's what people of that genre like. I shouldn't read a fantasy book and complain that there's too much development of setting. That's what fantasy readers like. So who's your intended audience? What are their expectations? Um, so that orients your reading, so to speak. Uh, again, what genre is it in? Because that's going to affect what audience you're, you're reading for, that they're writing for. If the text you're reading is a model of a particular style of writing, like a literary or it's a thriller maybe, um, reading like a writer is particularly helpful because you can look at a piece that you're reading and think about whether you want to adopt a similar style as other techniques. Now, Pops, uh, you have a kind of a different take on that, on, on reading within the genre. Yeah, I, I think we have that a little further along in the notes, but uh, you're right. Um, uh, some people advise that you read in your genre while you're writing in that genre. So if you're doing detective fiction, you're reading detective fiction. The possible drawback to that, and again, this will vary from person to person, is that you begin copying what you're reading. Good idea pops up and you, you plug it into your book. You notice something special being done, then you poke put that in your book. Um, and you end up not really plagiarizing at least words, but you're plagiarizing ideas. Uh, and so many of the writers that I know will not read in the same genre that they're writing in. And uh, I'm that way. I don't read uh, in the same genre that I'm writing. I'll read in other genres because the creativity and the craft is still basically the same thing. Um, but what I don't want to do is uh, become the copycat. Um, and sometimes seeing a, a whole set of someone else's ideas will squash your own ideas. Again, that's going to depend uh, on the way your brain works, the way you're wired. Um, so that's really just up to you. Uh, I just want to give that warning. Be careful with that. Yeah. I typically will read within my genre while I'm writing that genre. Um, but a lot of times that's because I'm exploring new genres that I haven't written in or read in much. And if that's going to be the case, then I feel like I owe it to my readers to really familiarize myself uh, with the breadth of work uh, within that particular genre so that I can be familiar with their expectations. Uh, but you're right. If I'm writing in a genre that I write in often and I feel like I already know that kind of stuff, you know, maybe I'm reading something else. Maybe I'm reading a sci-fi while I'm writing a fantasy. Maybe I'm writing a, a sci-fi while I'm reading a fantasy. But um, I think, again, it kind of depends on who you are as a reader. But if you are reading within your genre that you're writing, 
your advice pops is very sound. You do need to be cautious of, of lifting ideas and tropes and cliches. That's how we get, uh, you know, a million and one different Lord of the Rings, except it's not Lord of the Rings. It's Lord of the blings or, you know, <laughs> Lord of the gold. Lord of the bling. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's, you got to kind of consider that. And so Fido instead of Frodo and, yeah, you've got you got a lot of those out there floating around, and you want to you want to avoid that. You want to have your own unique spin on it, but uh, and sometimes you also it's wanna... unconscious. Sometimes we don't know we're picking these ideas up um, uh, from things. So you know, I I did in the Harbingers. I one of the books has to do with a, a really weird fog. Well, the book I was just talking about has a really weird fog. Uh, when I talk about the Dean Koontz book, uh, The Taken. Uh, and it was, I was reminding myself of that. I was thinking, did I get that idea from him? Well, I hadn't read it since 2004. Um, so I doubt that I did, but you know, of course, Stephen King did the fog and, um, but the, the problem is we can subconsciously lift these things. Now I do read in the, uh, the genre of my choice when I'm not working on a project. If, I, if I'm not, if I don't have a work in uh, progress, say in a suspense book, I'll read in suspense. If I'm working on nonfiction, then you know I'll read suspense or whatever else that I, I really like. But when it comes to the actual writing, I stay out of my genre and my reading. Hmm. After I do what I'll talk about in a little bit. Yeah. And, and getting set up. Yeah. Well, this this might actually be a good time for that. So before you start a project, what <coughs> what do you do? Well, here's what I used to do, and I still do it sometimes. Um, especially when I was starting out, though, I, I wanted to learn as much as I could. And there's a lot that goes into writing a book, more than what most people know. So what I would do is before starting a project, uh, I would, and as I said, I still do sometimes, gather a bunch of novels together, lay them out so I could switch from one to the other. Uh, sometimes I'd sit on the floor. I've got a very vivid memory of sitting cross-legged on the floor. You can tell I was a lot younger then. Um, and I think I had six or ten novels around me. And I started going through each of them. And this is the little exercise that I would do. I would look at each one and I would ask these questions. Question number one, how many pages in the book? So if it's the same genre as mine, um, you know, how did they handle it? So, for example, some genres, romance, westerns, are usually shorter. Not always. Some genres are much longer. Fantasy, for example, epic science fiction. Um, those kinds of things can often be very long. Or if you're dealing with some historicals, it can be very long because they cover a lot of time. Um, so I wanted to know uh, how many pages in this book. Then I would find out how many chapters. And I would make a chart out of this. How many chapters, how many pages. And that would allow me to figure out by doing the calculus of this, the average length of the chapter. Are they writing long chapters? Are they doing like Patterson writing very short chapters? Uh, which every scene is a chapter. You don't have several scenes. in. Uh, in a chapter, sometimes he would just use a scene as a chapter. I've done that a, a time or two um, when it fit. So how many chapters? Then what is the average length of the chapter? Uh, again, charting all of this. Is the author writing first person or third person? I wanted to know that. Is there a trend in that? Um, who is the uh, protagonist in the story? And with that would come some questions like, uh, uh, is, is it a female protagonist? Is it a male protagonist? Is it a child? Um, want to know who the protagonist is. Uh, is there a prologue? You know, there's some con controversy whether or not a novelist should use a prologue. Yeah, feel free. Uh, you know, you can you can blame me. Uh, prologues have been around for a very long time. And just to clarify that, uh, for those um, who may not understand, a prologue is what comes before the first chapter. And usually it's either not in the same timeline or not in the same place, but it will play a role later. So it's something that's sort of out of the story, but connected to the story. Um, if you have that kind of situation, then a prologue could be good. Is there an epilogue? Uh, that is, is there a chapter after all the action? Uh, and I would ask, what kind of balance is there between narration and dialogue? And you don't have to read the whole thing. You just open it up to several pages and look. Is there a lot of dialogue or not? Uh, or is there a lot of narration? So you're reading Arthur C. Clarke. There's a lot of narration. Um, you're reading others. Uh, maybe Isaac Asimov or something. There's a lot of dialogue. So, you know, it, it'll vary. There's some kind of balance that you can recognize in that. Uh, and again, what kind of balance is there between narration and dialogue? Uh, then I would also ask, uh, how did the author start the first chapter? And that was usually the most interesting thing to me. Uh, what was the first page like? 
how did they start? Uh, usually you start in some form of action. It doesn't have to be a gunfight, but usually you start in the middle of something. Uh, what middle did uh, he or she start in? <clears throat> so how did they start the first chapter? That gets ideas going. So uh, sometimes, I again, I'd make a chart, and this really put my brain in the correct year for doing the work. Then I'd make some decisions, put all the books back up, and uh, get busy with the writing. Yeah, I think that's a process that's really valuable to go through, especially early on, especially when you're learning the craft. Uh, you haven't, you don't have a lot of novels under your belt. You've read a bit uh, growing up, but you haven't been a, a real big reader. The, you maybe maybe sit down, like you say, pops, and pull some novels out, some of the greats, some of your favorites, as well as some of the the ones that are critically acclaimed or whatever the case may be. Um, experienced writers can still learn from this process as well. But I think what you'll find is once you do that, once you kind of study with that depth of, of analysis, um, it becomes somewhat second nature and you begin to take uh, mental notes. And so um, I remember, I believe Odd Thomas was the first book I read that had what might be considered micro chapters where the chapters are one or two pages long and you'd have, you know, 60 to 70 to 80 different chapters, which seems kind of long. Um, but when you consider they're only two pages, three pages each, you actually have kind of a shorter book. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a style that I hadn't seen used before. And I made a note of it because structurally it was different than what I was used to seeing, uh, especially compared to some of the fantasies, which will have a chapter that spans, you know, 40, 50, 60 pages, whatever the case may be. And so you'll start to do that instinctively. But if you haven't gone through that process at least once, it's probably worth your time. It's not going to be a quick thing. It's going to take you a bit, but um, it is, I think, well worth the effort. Um, once you've done that and you kind of get into gear and you, you're learning to do that as you go through, um, you should remember to ask yourself a couple additional questions. And, and I think there's some value here where you make this more relevant to yourself. So you're not just asking objective questions about the author's purpose or intended audience or, um, you know, the, their particular word choice or the structure. Now the question is, uh, where would I take this story? I see where the author is going. I know why they're going there. Where would I take it? Uh, why did the author choose to do this? Uh, what can I learn from it? What are they trying to tell me? Um, especially, especially when you see an author make a move that you didn't see coming, one that you didn't quite anticipate, uh, and yet it, it rings true. Pay attention to that. Flannery O'Connor does that in, in almost every one of her short stories. You get to the end and you're like, I did not anticipate that. I didn't see it coming. Go back and reread that. Uh, make a note of it. How did she pull it off? Um, you can ask yourself how effective is the language that the author is using? What kind of language are they using? Um, are, are they very formal? Are they informal? Do they move between the two? Um, at what points do they move between the two? Are they very detailed? Are they more minimalistic? Uh, those types of things. When you can start looking at, at language and the, even the construction of their sentences from long flowing sentences to short punchy sentences, um, Anytime you see <clears throat> a shift in the style that the author is using, you want to ask yourself why. Why this shift? What is the change? Uh, what is this change accomplishing? Uh, why did they choose to write in this fashion at this time? Um, making those types of, of uh, choices are, is really going to help uh, impact your writing in, I think, a pretty profound way. Yeah, and that's really one of the... I think great practices of the professional writers is start asking questions. And as you move along in your career, you'll be asking different questions too. And for each book uh, that you work on, each story, even if you're doing short stories, they're going to be, they're going to be different. Um, I first thought I might write short stories. I had very little luck with writing short stories. For some reason I can sell books, but short stories beyond me. Um, but I studied short stories, uh, how they worked, why they were, what was different from one to the other. Uh, it's really, th that's a lot of fun. I know it sounds like work. We're sitting here going, oh, you should do this, you should do this. But you know what? It's, it's really fun. If you love the words, if you love writing, if you love reading, then this is fun. This is candy. How does he do this? You're trying to, uh, you're, you're trying to solve the magician's tricks so that you can do the tricks too and uh, become the magician. And so you look at those little things. 
Uh, and when you find a really good author, and I'm, again, I think Dean Koontz is a master in, of the popular novel. Um, how does he do that? How does he structure his sentences? Because he does very length of sentences uh, for effect uh, at times. I think he has one where somebody's stabbed and it goes on for a page with no punctuation. Or, uh, I mean, no period. There's, you know, semicolons and uh, commas and stuff like that. But the reason is the act is so quick that it's over in a line. So how do you stretch that out? Well, he, he figured that out, uh, how to do that. Uh, how do you get the reader so tied up into it uh, that they don't want to do anything else? They want to call in sick, not go to work. Uh, you know, or as soon as they get home, the first thing they want to do is pick that book up again. Or I can't wait to lunch at work so they can read a little bit here and there. Um, yeah, it's... It's a great art form, and study is uh, the uh, the best way to learn it. But that's not arduous study. It's fun, it's intriguing. Absolutely, absolutely fun. It's intriguing. Um, there's a passage in All the Pretty Horses by Cormac McCarthy that it's a really ridiculously long sentence. I'm not going to try and repeat it. Um, and really, it's a bunch of sentences put together. But instead of periods, he's using and and this blah 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 and blah 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 and blah 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 and blah 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 and you you ask yourself why is he choosing to use this particular sentence structure well they're riding horses and the horses are clop clip clopping along very slowly up the Cienega mm. way with the moon in the distance you know setting and the this and the that and the smell of this and the and it it's a rhythm. It, he's thinking poetically and rhythmically and not just about um, regular grammar, spelling, punctuation. He's thinking about rhythm and the sounds of the words and the, and the rhythm and the beat and the musicality of it. And it's really, he, most people would read and go, this is weird. But it, when you stop and look at it, you go, oh, that's brilliant. That's really mm -hmm. brilliant. Um, and he does that a lot. He'll move between um, very beautiful, lengthy, flowery descriptions, but then his dialogue with uneducated, you know, uh, characters is short and clipped. And then he'll have somebody with, you know, a, a Harvard education come in and talk, and it's very long and flowery. And um, his ability to move between um, the two formalities of language is is really impressive. And that's he's a guy that I've learned quite a bit from. I, I love to study some Cormac McCarthy. Um, Flannery O'Connor is one that I've historically loved to study. Raymond Carver, um, in in terms of novel, Dean Koontz, as you mentioned. Um, trying to think of some others. Kurt Vonnegut, though I I could never do what he does. Um, I don't have the same style of voice, which is fine because he is who he is and I am who I am. But um, just in 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 terms of what you can do with very little, uh, I thought. I learned a lot from Vonnegut. Pops, who would you say, um, you've already mentioned Dean Koontz, but aside from Dean mm -hmm. Koontz, who would you say are the, kind of the positive examples, the role models, the, the novels that you pick up and, and you just feel like you've learned a bunch from them? Well, I've loved Ray Bradbury. Um, we've talked about him before where he's almost, he teeters on the verge of purple prose at times. Purple prose being overwriting, uh, flowery. And he gets very close to that, but he never crosses the line. And it has a, a beauty to it. So uh, I've studied some of his stuff, like it very much. I've liked um, Michael Crichton because I like that kind of story. Uh, so I like the way he reveals technology, how he brings it up, still keeps it interesting, still keeps the story going. I've not always liked the ending of some of his books, Sphere, for example. But oddly enough, I love the book. I just didn't like the way it ended. Um, I, th I think it was a mistake. But the rest of the book, well, I've read it twice. Uh, and, you know, for the most part, really loved that book. Uh, so he would be another one. Um, I used to study uh, Jack Cavanaugh. He has a good way with words. Uh, and you can get pulled in and feel quite comfortable in the flow of the text and what he's talking about. Uh, those are good. Tom Morrissey, who we've had on as a guest uh, before, is, uh, he's just, he's a fabulous writer. Um, you know, he, he did a lot of adventure stuff because he was a, an adventure guy. Um, works for Disney now in Florida, but uh, he, you know, would have to relay a lot of information about mountain climbing or cave diving or something like that. 
but his writing was always uh, beautiful, uh, almost transcendent at times. Uh, excellent, excellent writer. So he's uh, he's been somebody who's educated me uh, some. So there's really a, a whole bunch of them. I'd list Tim O'Brien among my my uh, list that I I included there. Tim O'Brien is just fascinating. F. Scott Fitzgerald too, but um, Orson Scott or, Card. Orson Scott Card is very very good, very good. Really don't um, like that guy. He's so good, just angers me. Petty jealousy. That's yeah. how I feel about Tom Brady. He's the greatest of all time. Ah, eh, whatever. Yeah, that might be true, but <laughs> yeah. And uh, Orson Scott Card is good. We listened to one of his books on. Um, in audio while traveling mm -hmm. and even in audio I'm going along and say, well, he probably could have used. No, he really couldn't. You know, if you change that word to no, that'd make it worse. And so I think I spent half the trip um, trying to correct something he's done. Only find out he made the perfect choice. Mm. He's irritating that way. Stuff Very is, much so. <laughs> stuff is good. Very well done. Yeah, that's it's it's funny you mentioned that because that is one of the questions that we have from the chat room, and we've we've kind of covered the breadth of okay. our our show notes here. And um, the idea of audiobooks came up, and uh, Dave, I'm going to paraphrase Dave's question here, but his his question was, "Can you learn as much about writing from listening to an audiobook as you can from holding the novel in your hands and analyzing it?" Um, my quick answer, and I'll answer while you think about the question pops, is um, I think you can, but I think you learn different things. Uh, if you've got the physical novel in your hands, you can highlight. I know I'm going to probably offend someone. You can highlight. You can write in the margins. I, For me, that's writing a love note to the author. It's saying thank you for this wonderful gift that you've given us. Um, or in some cases, why have you published this garbage? Um, I hate you. Uh, whatever the, you know, it depends on which book you're reading. If you're reading one of my novels where you say this is garbage please uh please don't ever write a book again or you're reading one of pops where it's like this is glorious uh please don't ever stop writing uh whatever the case may be uh that's the advantage and you can go back to it and you can look at it very easily and you can flip through the pages and find what you need very quickly an audiobook for me is a different experience it's it's um still an experience. I feel like I can still learn from it. I'm still analyzing word choice, but I'm starting to look at more holistic things like pacing, structure, descriptions. I, I still look at those. Um, but sometimes the diction, uh, depending on the writer, sometimes the diction can get a little bit lost. Um, Audio books that I consume, I'm usually not consuming for the pure sake of study. It's usually for um, basically ease of, of time and, and busy schedules. Uh, but if I really want to tear into something, I'm going to have, uh, the physical novel in my hands. It's a little more, I think, rewarding that way, but, um, that's not to say that audiobooks are by any stretch of the imagination useless. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think you can learn more about, um, the audio quality of your books, um, and, and your writing and, and thinking about things like pacing, thinking about things like, uh, rhythm and cadence and, uh, structure, overall structure. Uh, I think that becomes important. Uh, we just finished listening to, or we're still well, almost done. My wife and I are almost done listening to Fahrenheit 451 mm -hmm. on audio. And we did that because uh, we have time together in the car, but that's generally the only time that we have together. So if we're going to listen to something together, we got to, kind of maximize our time there. But um, Ray Bradbury is one that I can learn a lot from, even in audio form. I don't know how you feel about it, Pops. Yeah, I, uh, I listen to Fahrenheit 451 on audio. Um, yeah, and I think you can. You, you remember, um, there's really three modalities for learning. Uh, we're either visual, so it comes through the eyes, or uh, audio, it comes through the ears, uh, or, or kinesthetic, it comes from doing with it. Uh, so I think you can, as long as you're a careful listener, if you're just playing it in the background, you're probably not going to learn much. But if you're really listening to how it's done, then uh, I think so. And so I'm very big on that. Uh, I have my computer read to me, uh, read passages to me uh, of my own, my own writing to me so I can hear it. Uh, and I often pick up mistakes or shortcomings uh, by listening that I can't pick up while reading. So I think, yes, now, I would not say that should be your only means um, to do that because there's also the way that's structured on the page. Um, 
you know, especially in fiction, we have a lot more elbow room than say nonfiction. You know, we, there's no problem with a one word paragraph. Uh, you know, there's no problem with an uh, incomplete uh, sentence because it's meant to be incomplete. Uh, so sometimes how it appears on the page is just as important uh, as uh, the words itself. So uh, I would say a combination of, but I do, I would say, yes, you can learn a lot by listening uh, to a book. Uh, and sometimes it sits there. Another thing you can do is read it on uh, is an ebook. And the reason is you can underline in an ebook. You can highlight really what you can do. Or even if you don't do that, but you remember a turn of phrase, say uh, Fahrenheit 451 about the pages, uh, uh, burning pages falling like leaves from a tree uh, in an up, from an upstairs library. Uh, let's say you you remember that and you want to find that way well, in an ebook you can search and it will uh, it will hunt down the phrase uh, for you so that saves you a ton of time and uh, so I find that very useful uh, and I usually do that with uh, nonfiction books too because it's much easier to search for things mm -hmm. and in an ebook when you do highlight something it keeps track of that you can look at all your highlights yeah. You don't have to flip through the pages looking for them. So, so we've got a couple more questions here, and right. we'll just hit them real quick. Molly wants to know, how do you present your case to someone who says they're too busy writing to read? So um, I, I basically, Stephen King talks about this in his novel, on his, his book That's on what writing. That's just thinking of. <laughs> Yeah, he's, I mean, you ever see Stephen King, he's like you say, Pops, he's at the, the baseball game um, reading a book. He says, have you ever been to the DMV? <laughs> then you have time to read. And so the <laughs> idea is he keeps, a, he keeps a book in his back pocket and wherever he goes, he pulls it out and you're at a red light, pull it out. Well, I don't know if I can suggest that on air because it might be dangerous, but um, we've got books on our phones now. There's no reason not to carry an entire library in your pocket. And again, standing in line at the DMV, you're reading, um, waiting for the kids to brush their teeth to get into bed. You can read a couple of pages. You don't have to read an entire novel in a week. You can do an entire novel in, in a month or two months. Just reading is, is important. And if you are not reading, I would say that you are starving you're writing. Well, I have these kids, but I'm too busy working to feed them. Nobody would say that. That that's that's ridiculous. And so, but um, the professional athlete. Well, I'm too busy practicing to actually watch football. No, you still watch football. The greats always do. And so you you make the time. Um, you realize that if you want to be a professional, you need to behave like a professional. And for whatever reason, writing is the only profession where people think they can do it without studying it, without reading. And it's it's kind of frustrating to me as, as a professional writer, one who's been educated in it. I would spend way too much money learning how to do this professionally. And and to think that, that some people are going to say, well, I'm never going to read a novel, but I'm going to write a bestseller. Stop. If you don't know what people are wanting, if you're not reading. And so you need to be a consumer of the written word as much as you are a peddler of the written word that that would be my response and that's well nice i would response. i would agree with that and I've, I've come across a couple um i did some editing for somebody who told me um the, the first novel i ever read i wrote and I, I knew i was in for a long haul mm -hmm. on this um then i i had somebody send me the proposal and they said can you help me al i'm not getting any traction on this i don't know what's wrong first line of the proposal was I, I don't read much fiction, but I know I can write better than what's out there. Well, first of all, it's a nonsensical statement. How do you know you can write better if you haven't read what's out there? Um, so I took him to task on that. That's the advantage of getting older. They just say, oh, well, he's old, so he's grumpy. Um, you know, but I, I had to tell him, you know, you just alienated everybody. The, the editors who put that work out there, uh, the <laughs> readers write, he's just... You know, you, you just shot yourself on the foot. You know, this has no chance if you're going to do this. You need to rewrite the whole front end of this proposal. Um, and you need to read what it is you're trying to produce. Um, so, yeah, I think you uh, you have to read. There are people who will say, I don't have time to read. I'm too busy writing. I would say if you're not reading, you're not really writing. Mm -hmm. Or it will That's never right. be as good as it can be. Yeah. Um, 
again, you just, you kind of starve in your own writing is the way I think of it. You've got to have creative input as much as you have creative output. Um, you know, it's, it's what you put in is what you get out. So the better stuff you read, the better you are going to produce. Um, we've got one last question here. We are coming, kind of coming up against the clock here, Pops, but this one is for you specifically coming uh -oh. from Caleb Walton. Uh, and it has to do with the, the question of reading within the genre that you're writing. So he says, Pops, I've had the same problem with reading in the genre in which I'm writing, but as a new writer, I feel like I need to explore good books in that genre. Do you have any suggestions? Well, Caleb, uh, yeah, the, the full thing that I said is I do read in my genre, and I've got several genres now, but I do read in, in that genre, uh, just not while I'm writing the book. So I'll go through and um, I would often read, again, Dean Koontz or some of the others uh, that we've mentioned before I started writing. Once I started writing, if I was in that genre, I would not, uh, I would not, I'm not saying no one else can do it. Uh, it's a problem for me. And I know it's been a problem for others. I just would not uh, read in the genre I'm writing. I'll read something else. And here's the other reason. If if you're writing in a particular genre, let's say you're writing a Western and you're reading Westerns, then you're never off the clock. Okay, You're writing Western. You're, you're plotting Western. You're doing all of those things. And then now you're going to sit down and relax and you're going to read in the same genre. It's like you're doing, uh, you know, we're working at night and day on the thing. Give your brain a break. Choose something else. You're still going to learn from the other writing. The genre doesn't make that big a difference, other than maybe structure or something like that. But um, it doesn't uh, mean it's going to distract you if you're reading uh, a science fiction book while working on a Western. You could end up doing uh, Star Trek. That's what that was. That was just a Western in space. So I, I would also. Trying. Yeah, I would also add to that. Um, perhaps one suggestion might be read some craft books while you're writing, um, or uh, take a moment before you begin writing the novel to read within that genre to get a few books under your belt there, and then you can go ahead and and start writing after you've got that good strong foundation. Like you say, pops, I, th I think genre expectations really the reason you're going to re read within a genre is to learn the expectations but good writing is good writing um it, I, 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 let me let me throw down on that one too uh, the other problem we haven't talked about in doing this is if you're reading uh, a book uh that's in your genre so you're doing horror and you're reading a stephen king book while you're trying to write horror uh you're going to start comparing yourself and get discouraged. My book is not as good as this book. But you have to remember when that book came out, <laughs> at first it went through Stephen King's mind several times and several rewrites while you're still doing your first rewrite. And then it went to an editor who d dug into it with sharp claws, who would send comments back. And Stephen King would do what he needed to do uh, if, if the comments were good to bring it up to speed. Then it might go to copy editors who have done the same kind of thing and maybe make suggestions. This sentence could be stronger if you do this. So you're not reading just a book by an author. You're reading a book by a team. Okay. And then you're comparing what you're doing in your rough draft with that. And it gets very discouraging. That's another reason I don't read in my genre uh, while I'm writing in that genre. Hmm. Well said. Well said. Well, that is our time for this evening. Uh, I feel like we've got all the questions. Do want to say thank you to uh, our 10 viewers and uh, those of you in the chat room following along and, and participating. Molly Pops, I don't know if you mentioned it or if I mentioned it, but Molly was able to make it to the chat room. So she's been uh, still kind of on the clock a little bit. So uh, uh, good for I see things. how it is. Yeah. Thanks for popping in, Molly. She, she said she would have been on the show, but she didn't have a voice so i i don't understand um but uh, yeah we're glad that she's at least feeling up to being in the chat room she says she's going to go to bed immediately after this so uh yeah that's our, our show uh next week or in a couple of weeks we're going to be looking at encouragement from discouragement what to do when you want to quit because you are going to want to quit in some days. So looking forward to that. That'll be in two weeks at 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. In the meantime, if you'd like to find us, you can find Pops at altongansky.com. You can find me at aarongansky.com. The newly redesigned aarongansky.com. If you haven't seen it in the last couple of weeks, take a look. And you can find Molly at franklymydearmojo.com. So we thank you all for listening. And until next week, good writing. <laughs>